Good morning. Good to be with you all again this morning on this overcast day that the Lord has made. Let us pray. Eternal and loving God in whom we live, move, and have our being, we are grateful for this day, for this is the day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We lift up you, O oh God, who sits high and looks low, keeps us in perfect peace, hides us in the shelter of your loving arms. Now, in the midst of this day, Father God, may you be glorified in all that we say and do. May you get the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' matchless and wonderful name, let us all say amen. 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 So you have heard the reading, but I want to lift up for you from Exodus 16 uh, these two verses. Verses 2 and 3, the whole congregation, that means all of them. Other Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. For the moment that we have this morning, I want to share this title tag to this text, Grumbling and Grace. Grumbling and grace. I can imagine that the people of Israel were frustrated and tired. It had been one and a half months since Moses and Aaron led the entire congregation of Israel on a flight to freedom by foot. Even after nine demands and ten plagues, Pharaoh would not permit Israel to leave because he believed his little God was more powerful to than their God of all creation. But after the last let my people go, Moses with the sovereignty of God's power led Israel from a foreign and familiar land into the wilderness. The time had come. Israel had to get up, pack up, and move out. The living generation would now press forward on ancestral prayers, dreams, and hopes. The Lord heard them. The Lord saw them. The Lord remembered. So the journey began. God guided them by being a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And after God protected them by closing the road to and through the Red Sea, they were able to settle and begin a new life of freedom. No more making bricks without straw. No more mud pits and lashes. No more sun up and sun down break back breaking work days. No more being afraid of Pharaoh's army. Israel was no longer in bondage. 430 years is a long time in one place that is not your own but has become your home. Would they remember what life looked like before captivity? How well might they have told their story from one generation to the next? Even the bones of Joseph could not rattle loud enough to reminisce about their journey, but they were free, celebrating and rejoicing and remembering until their provisions began to run low in the wilderness and they began to face food insecurity. The memory of 430 years cannot compare to what was just six weeks prior. For them, long-term pain made for short-term gain. It seemed to be no matter that the God who saved them protected them, and provided for them would be the same God who would keep them, shield them, and deliver them time and again. There was another transition in their long history of transitions, wandering in the wilderness, a return to Egypt, the death of Joseph, their enslavement, their protection in Goshen during the plagues, and now their freedom. In the wilderness, what ought to be was not what was, so I can imagine they were frustrated and tired. And like many of us, when we get frustrated and tired, we have a tendency to complain. Complaining can come easily. Bad customer service, traffic, finding parking this morning, slow mail delivery, the cost of food, gas, and other commodities, unstable Wi-Fi, the economy, about our leaders and their leadership, neighbors who won't cut their grass or pick up their trash, and the list can go on and on. 
In the case of Israel, their complaints tell the real story of what was going on in their lives. Their complaints were not about individual issues, but the collective dissatisfaction with their situation. They were intricately connected by a system of oppression that signified that they were experiencing a shared struggle. They were captured and enslaved. They endured harsh and horrific labor conditions. They were economically disenfranchised. They were physically and emotionally oppressed. They were marginalized. They posed a perceived threat to the security of the privileged because they crossed borders into sanctuary cities. Again, it is not hard to believe that the people of Israel were frustrated and tired. However, their excessive complaining made them self-absorbed. The Bible says the whole congregation of Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. It wasn't a few of them or half of them. It was the entire congregation, the entire assembly who had been delivered from bondage but was now complaining. The once quiet wilderness now echoed with discontent and grumbling. The attempt to be quiet, the, the attempt to quiet their complaints might have been the impulse for Moses and Aaron, but sometimes you can't compete against memory. Sometimes you won't win against what people remember as their safe place despite their difficulty and hardship. It is important to remember that in Egypt, Pharaoh had given Israelite Goshen because of Joseph. Goshen was a comfort zone for them. Joseph had, been cho Joseph had chosen Goshen because it was separated from Egypt and was a land where they could practice their rituals and beliefs from the pagan practices of the Egyptians. And they were good memories and the place they once called home. But in verse three, we hear their longing for a familiar place as well as their complaint when they said to Moses and Aaron, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Yeah, Goshen was home. Home is where the heart is, right? But now, free from bondage, they find themselves in the wilderness where they first couldn't drink the water, and now they beg for food. For them, Goshen was not a desert place, but a deserted home. They now had to find themselves further from the promised land. Their oasis was now a wilderness called the land of sin, no pun intended, which was now a long way from anywhere. Now let us understand what is happening here in this text. 45 days after departing from Goshen, 45 days after leaving their comfort place to a desert place, and 45 days later the whole congregation of Israel never cried out to God. They never asked God for water. They never asked God for food. They didn't remember that God delivered them from the hands of Pharaoh. They didn't go to Moses or Aaron for prayer. They didn't go to God. They neither uttered a confession of faith nor thanked God for God's promises. Instead, they grumbled. They rejected Moses and Aaron and turned their back on God, who had done some miraculous things in their lives. They were experiencing another transition but could not see how their freedom was in God's hand. What more could Moses and Aaron do but doing what God called them to do? Perhaps Moses and Aaron were frustrated and tired. And in the words of Reverend James Forbes, he says, if you want to know how to lead a people with PTSD, just ask Moses. God had been gracious to Israel. Where was their faith? This is not to be critical, but to pose the question for us. We must walk in another person's shoes to grasp their point of view. I don't believe that Israel had forgotten about God, but even after 430 years, they saw a transition rather than a transformation. 
Their transition left them skeptical about resources. And I see it all the time at our food pantry where I serve and the way our neighbors arrive to the food pantry two hours in advance just to ensure that they don't miss out what we have to give out. They line up before the doors open and they will endure the heat or frigid temperatures to get to the first fruits of what we have to give. There's a real sense that when resources are not available, we will lose out. Transitions can bring a sense of uncertainty and anxiety. The fear of the unknown and the possibility of change can trigger our own anxiety, especially when you don't know how to navigate the new situation you are in and depending on someone else to get you through the, the way. Transitions, as you know, also bring loss and grief. They become, the familiar becomes unfamiliar. Starting anew is sometimes difficult when you have to let go of the past. Transitions prompt self-reflection. It can force you to ask yourself the question, who am I? What is my purpose? Can I adapt in the wilderness of uncertainty on the way to God's promised land? Transitions can also, though, make you resilient. There are times when you don't know how strong you are or the courage you possess without going through a transition. The power of this is to be able to say you were able to get through it because God brought you to it. So here we are. Rather than seeing this transition as an opportunity for transformation, Israel grumbled. The whole congregation complained against Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron were rejected as leaders. Their complaints were loud and clear. Their anxiety was high. They began to grieve the loss of the past even though the past was not pleasant. The unfamiliar and the unknown made them fearful. They began to implode rather than pivot toward God's promise. They began to have flashbacks. They were triggered. They considered dying by the hand of the Lord to be more advantageous than dying from hunger in the wilderness. But God showed up. The grumbling had become enough. The chronic complaining had reached the peak. But before Moses and Aaron could respond, God stepped in. God intervened. God extended grace because, with, because and it was without rebuke. And that's important to know in our lives that when we're complaining, God will give us grace, but will not rebuke us because of our complaints. God acknowledged their complaint and gave instructions to Moses and Aaron to give to the congregation that simply comes down to this. God provides. And when we are reminded of God's provision, we are also reminded of what Moses said to Israel. Your complaining is not against us. Your complaining is against the Lord. And so this brings us to three simple points raised about our grumbling and the beauty of God's grace. First point is God hears. God hears. God hears you. It matters not who you complain to. God hears you. There is nothing you can say in secret that God does not know. There's nothing in your thought that God does not hear. God hears us even when we fail to go to God in prayer. Yet too often we walk to and talk to any and everybody but God. But there's an old, old hymn that we don't sing much anymore that I learned as a child that goes something like this. Now have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He will hear your faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. Hear a little prayer will turning, and know a little fire is burning. Just have a little talk with Jesus, will make it right. God hears your heartache. God hears your pain. God knows your struggle. Instead of going to everyone else about your situation, go to God. First, talk to God. God can handle what you are going through. Nothing is too hard for God's ears. Nothing is too hard for God's ears. And then secondly, not only does God hear, 
but God sees. The problem Israel had in the wilderness is that they believed they had been abandoned by God. Remember, they said to Moses and Aaron, you have brought us out here to the wilderness. Remember when, Aaron, when Moses had to go into the mountain to get the tablets of stone, they had not heard from God. They thought God had abandoned them, but God could see everything that was happening in their lives. And sometimes it might be difficult to trust God when you can't trace God. But God sees what you're going through. We serve a God that will never leave us nor forsake us. We serve a God that sits high and looks low. We serve a God that sees and knows our pain. A God that hears our thoughts and our cries. God sees you. So you won't have to, so when the words won't come, know that God sees you. When your arms are outstretched to the Lord, know that God sees you. When you are sitting and swaying from side to side because trouble has come your way, know that God sees you. When we're in worship and we lift up our hands and clap our hands and sing our songs, know that God sees you. When trouble comes your way, know that God sees you. When you have your hands clasped in prayer, God sees you. And when your eyes begin to water and the tears begin to stream, God sees you. God will fight your battles because God sees you and God hears you. And then finally, because God hears and God sees, God gives us grace. That's a beautiful message for today. God gives us grace. It is in the ninth verse where God instructs Moses and Aaron to say to Israel, Israel, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Sometimes that's what we have to do, church. Sometimes in our darkest nights, our midnight hours, sometimes when we don't know where to turn or where to go or who to talk to, sometimes all we have to do is look up, lift up our eyes to the hills from whence comes our help because our help comes from the Lord. We look up and God appears to us. God sends God's spirit to us. Grace is given to the Israelites despite their behavior and sinful nature. God blesses them with food, and the glory of God is revealed to them. This is grace. Grace they didn't deserve, but grace that was, that was granted. God desires a relationship with us and stands by his words that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's with this promise that we receive God's grace. This is the good news. Good news because when we can't find our way and don't know where to go, God sends grace. And to ensure that we receive grace all of our lives, more than 2,000 years ago, God delivered the greatest gift of grace any of us could ever ask for. This gift was born and called by the name of Jesus. He was not sent into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, might, that the world through him might be saved. What a gift of grace is to us. This is the gift that saves us, redeems us, and says that your sins are forgiven. A gift that lets us cast all of our cares upon him. So grumble and complain all you want, but take it to the Lord in prayer. When you are too weak, take it to the Lord in prayer. When your burdens are heavy, take it to our Lord in prayer. When you are hurting and in pain and people don't seem to understand you, take it to the Lord in prayer. When you are frustrated and tired, take it to the Lord in prayer because we serve a mighty God who has given us by his grace, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I close with the hymn, that most of you have probably sung in your hearts. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Our precious Savior, he is still our refuge. 
take it to the Lord in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All we have to do with our burdens is take it to the Lord in prayer because God hears you. God sees you. And most importantly, God gives you and all of us grace. May God add a blessing to the hearing of his word.